All right, well, thank you all, worship team, for that. We, um, this morning we'll be in Revelation chapter 14, back to our study in the, our series uh, on Revelation. Revelation unveiled, and if you've been with us for a number of months now, <laughs> we've been going through Revelation, which um, it's not only the last book in the Bible, um, it is probably one of the most interesting books because it deals with uh, a lot to do with end time prophecy and uh, things of that nature. And so uh, that's the section of the book that we're in. We've, uh, you know, as we began our study, we know that there are really three things that the book of Revelation addresses. All of them have to do with the return of Jesus. Okay, it is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so this is uh, all about the things pertaining to uh, his second coming, uh, things that will be preceding it, uh, things that will happen during it, uh, then there'll be some things that happen after it. And um, Jesus tells us in chapter 1, verse 19, that uh, that's really the, the layout of the book is threefold. There's, uh, he tells John to write the things which are, or things, excuse me, things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will come to pass after these things. And that third section is really where we find ourselves uh, today. We're well advanced uh, now into uh, what the book of Revelation has to tell us about future things. And so without recapping all of that, um, that we've, because we've covered a lot of terrain, um, we're just, we're going to just sort of jump in here today and just say this, that the last couple of chapters, chapters 12 and 13, we've really gotten a spotlight um, on the enemy, the strategy of the enemy. So we have the plan of the dragon, Satan. We have the activity of the lawless one, the Antichrist. And we have the influence of the false prophet. And so all of that is, is really uh, expounded upon in chapters 12 and 13. And, uh, and, and we need to know all of that. Uh, but as we come to chapter 14, there's a very marked transition as we get into chapter 14, verse 1. Uh, instead of really this being about the voice of the enemy or the strategy of Satan, we really transition into chapter 14, and this is what I would call it, uh, voices of victory. So we have in chapter 14, by my count, seven voices, seven, um, it's probably the best way to phrase it, voices of victory. There are uh, angels, there are voices from heaven, seven of them by my counting, uh, and uh, each of them is associated with the return of Jesus, something to do with the return of Jesus and the victory that is associated with that. So these voices are in some way a response to or immediately preceding the return of Jesus. And so it'll make sense as we jump in and, and dive in if I didn't explain that well. But um, so at any way, uh, at any rate, so as we as we get in chapter 14, we're we're getting away from the strategy of Satan and his attempt to reframe the truth. And so we're getting into Jesus coming back, who is the truth. And Satan's elaborate plan is, come, is going to come to an end at the coming of Jesus. You know, they always, you know, they have the saying, you know, it's, it's not over till it's over, right? It's not over till the, I probably can't say that one. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you know what I was going to say there. Uh, I got the look from my wife. You don't don't want to say it. anyway. Um, so <laughs> it's not over till it's over. Um, but the point is, when Jesus comes back, it is over. And what is over? Okay, the reign of Satan is over. The reign of Satan is finished. Uh, and there's several other things that we're going to see that are going to come to a close when Jesus returns. And some of these voices have to do with that. And so let's begin with a word of prayer, and we'll dive into the first five verses. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the truth that you've given us the privilege today of just having in our own language um, that we can uh, read it, that we can understand it. We're thankful for uh, you teaching us about these events that will come to pass, uh, even if we're not here for them. We, we do um, pray today that you help us to understand and to lay hold of uh, whatever application you have for us today uh, as it relates to, to what you have here. So, um, again, we ask for your spirit to guide us in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 14, verse 1 says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters, 
and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and for the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, there's a lot to unpack just right there in the first five verses, and I just want you to understand, first of all, the, the context of this first voice, which we see accompanied with lots of different descriptive language here, but we see uh, this voice of this 144,000 singing this new song, and we'll get into kind of what we think the song is about, but, but first let's just kind of grasp the context of it. Why, why are they singing? Where are they singing? What are they, I mean, what's the sort of the scenario here? Well, we see from verse 1 that it is at the return of Jesus, as Jesus, it says, the Lamb, okay, not a Lamb, the, the Lamb, and so there's only one, the Lamb, okay, throughout Scripture, you know, there were many lambs. Uh, many lambs were offered up in sacrifice. Um, thousands, perhaps millions of sacrificial lambs were offered. But there's only one, the lamb. John the Baptist positively identified him. He said, this is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. And he's referencing Jesus, that Jesus would be the sacrifice, his sacrifice. He would be the perfect sacrifice uh, as the lambs were sacrificed, Jesus would be sacrificed on the cross. And, uh, and so he is the lamb. So he's not the, like the false prophet, remember from last chapter. Last, in the last chapter, we had one who uh, was like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. Okay, that's a different, it's a different lamb. Okay, it's a, it's, a false, it's a false prophet. This is the lamb, this is Jesus. And he's standing on Mount Zion, which is a reference to Jerusalem. And it says, with him, this 144,000. Now, we've been introduced to the 144,000 before, and I believe it was in chapter 7. And uh, so we learned a little bit about who these people uh, were at that time. And it is a, a segment, a, a small segment, actually, of, uh, of Jewish people whom the Lord has supernaturally protected during this tribulation period. It's not the whole nation, but it's a, it's a remnant, okay? It's a certain section, uh, 12,000 from each tribe, and uh, the Lord has, uh, like He does so often in Scripture, has uh, people whom He preserves from certain trials and those whom He preserves through certain trials. Um, and so this is a group whom the Lord is pro uh, providing for and He's preserving through this great tribulation. He's, and so, anyway, we talked more about that when we were, when we were in chapter 7. But this is, so this is Jesus. He's coming back to Mount Zion. And it's very important we understand that that is not new information. Because as, as we've really developed as we're going through this, this study, that there's a lot of false information. And as the as the end draws near, okay, there are lots of false Christs, false prophets uh, who will come along and they'll say, no, 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 y'all have got this all wrong. You know, you've got the wrong Jesus. This is, you know, your scriptures are incorrect. It's really, this is, this is the right, you know, this is it over here. Truth's over here. No, not that, this. And so uh, what we need to understand is that the real Jesus, the true Jesus of scripture um, comes as it has been predicted, okay, not differently, not, well, you know, y'all had it wrong, it's really like that. No, he comes in the way that it was predicted by Scripture. And we actually know from several passages of, uh, passages of Scripture that G when Jesus does come back, uh, he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. And that, if you know about Jerusalem, so on the eastern side of the city, just outside the old, what would be the old city, uh, there's, a, there's a valley, and then there's a, just a few hundred yards, there's what's the, called the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is where Jesus ascended from. And so if you read Acts chapter 1, and this is kind of important, but it, in Acts chapter 1, as Jesus is ascending, okay, 
He's got the disciples with him. They're standing there on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus is, is taken up from the Mount of Olives. And as they're just kind of standing there with their mouths hanging open, um, this angel tells them, it says, this Jesus, okay, this Jesus, that's important, this Jesus that you saw being taken into heaven will come back in the same way as you saw him depart. Okay, so when Jesus comes back, one of the things, obviously from Scripture, it will be unmistakable. Uh, it will be not easily confused with any other event. When Jesus comes back, it will be obvious, and he will come in accordance with Scripture. He will come back to the Mount of Olives. And Zechariah 14 also is another interesting passage, if you have time to look at that. In the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, it gives much more detail into what's going to happen at that moment. But Zechariah, consistent with Acts chapter 1 and Revelation 14, tells us that when Jesus does come back, he's going to come to the Mount of Olives, that the earth will split. Okay, the earth is going to split at that time, and there's a whole slew of other things that are going to happen. Uh, but again, you can read that chapter. Um, but he's going to come in the same way as, as they saw him go. He's going to come back. And when he comes back... Um, Several passages, including Zechariah 14, tells us that when he comes back, it says he will bring his holy ones with him. So you and I will be with Jesus when he returns. Are you a holy one? Okay, I hope you're a holy one. <laughs> okay, Holy simply means, okay, it means set apart. Are you set apart? Are you in Christ? Or in other words, are you a believer? If you're a believer, then you are a holy one. Okay, that is what the word saint means. It's a holy one, a set apart one. Uh, you and I have been set apart, not by our own works, but because the Holy Spirit has set us apart. Okay, he has caused us to be born again. We are His holy ones. Anyway, a lot we could say about that. But when Jesus comes back, we'll be with Him, Mount Zion. But specifically here, who we're keying in on, this first voice of victory, is associated with this 144,000. And so, what do we learn about them in this particular passage? Well, first of all, they're singing a song. But as it's being described, they kind of get to the fact that they're singing a song, but it's associated with, it says, this voice from heaven like the roar of many waters. Okay, then it says, like the sound of loud thunder. And then it also says, it says it was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Okay, when you read that, like, it's like thunder. It's like the roar of many waters. It's like harpists playing on their harps. I don't, I'm just going to be honest with you here. I don't know that I've ever listened to much harpists play on harps. I'm not sure I know what that sounds like. <laughs> but we get this feeling that this sound is intense. It is awe-inspiring. And it has to do with these 144,000 singing this song, whatever this turns out to be. But we know that it's a song of victory. And it's, uh, so it's them singing. Now, 144,000 people, just to give you an idea, I mean, we're talking about, okay, a large, you know, college football stadium holding maybe what, like 50,000, something like that. So figure like three of those. Now picture, th you know, three packed out college football stadiums of people singing. Okay, I could see where that would sound like, that would make a lot of noise, wouldn't it? Okay, and so maybe that's what it's a reference to that, th that they're singing. But what is it that they're singing? So it's associated with Jesus coming back, and, and, it's, and, and him coming back is their deliverance. Does that make sense? And so, and, and so throughout the Scripture, we have different groups of people singing songs like this. And each song is a little bit unique. You know, when the Israelites were led through the Red Sea and God destroyed the Egyptians, by causing the waters to to re, you know to recede and go back over the Egyptians and destroy the Egyptian army, you know when they came out of that on the other side, there was a song that got sung at that moment, and that song was specific. Not that somebody else couldn't sing it, but but that song was specific to them at that moment because it it was really about the way that God has delivered me. How has God shown up in my life? How have I experienced his deliverance personally? You know, each of us experience that. There's a lot of similarity in the way we experience that. But in some ways, it is kind of unique, isn't it? Like, you know, when I came to Jesus for salvation, there was a certain sort of a scenario that led up to that. And, and, and as a Christian, there's been things that God has delivered me 
from, and there's been things that God has delivered me through. You know, and that's unique to me as far as the specifics. But, but you, you've been delivered in, in a specific way as well from certain things. You've been delivered through certain things. And, and in that scenario, I mean, we, each of us have a song to sing, a song of worship, a song of praise, a, a song of deliverance. This is what my God has done for me. And that's what I believe is the context of this song. What are they singing about? Well, they have uniquely been delivered through a, a, traumatic, a very traumatic time. And God has done it in a way that's specific to them. And they're singing uh, this song, this voice. They're lifting up their voice in praise to him about that is what I believe it is. Uh, furthermore, we're told about these 144,000. It says that they are, of course, we know from the previous passage, they are out of the nation of Israel. Um, they are, we're told here that they are, uh, that they're virgins. And without elaborating a lot on that, um, just, it stands in contrast to the rest of the folks that we're going to be looking at, especially when we get down to the second angel and it, who's talking about Babylon. So at this time, which we can kind of see it around us today, right? Um, how can I say this? Sexual immorality is rampant. Okay, and it is an affront to God's created order. Um, but it's also associated, when we think about Babylon, when we get there, it's actually associated with idolatry. Okay, there's a, an overlap there. So the fact that these are um, single people, virgins, is really uh, more about them standing in contrast to the society that they're coming out of. Uh, so we'll touch more on that when we get uh, down farther. Uh, but we're told also that they, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. Uh, it says in their, in their mouth no, no lie was found, for they are blameless. Now that's kind of interesting. We think about blameless. Is blameless and sinless the same thing? They're actually not the same thing. And so if we're, if we're looking for sinless people, okay, the Bible is very clear. There, there are none. Okay, none of us are sinless. Um, the Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. None of us are righteous. I mean, compared to each other, maybe, but not according to God's standards. None of us that are, are righteous. None of us are sinless. Um, but we can be blameless, and that's a little different. Okay, and blameless, uh, so here's the thing. Blameless carries with it the idea of there's nothing in my life or your life that you can really latch onto and 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 have a claim about. Okay, that's what blameless means. So it just means that doesn't mean sinless, but it means that okay that I have honestly, truthfully, before God, we've we've it's been dealt with. Okay, so the way how do we deal with sin? Well, first of all, we accept the free gift of salvation provided by Jesus on the cross. That's the first step. When we come to Jesus, we lay hold of his free gift of salvation, which is by his grace. We lay hold of it through faith. Okay, we are positionally, we are made right before God. Okay, now, once that takes place, there's something that we as believers need to, to, to worry about, and that is that we, that we stay clean in our relationship, our fellowship with God. Now, this is how we, this is how we are, are blameless. Okay, because our, as believers, are we going to sin? Absolutely. We're going to mess up. We're going to get out of sorts with God. But the way that we deal with that is 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. You know, we confess our sins. We agree with God about our sin. Okay, and He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We've talked about that. So that's how we walk blamelessly. It's not that we don't mess up but we deal with it before the Lord. So there's not some, some sort of pending issue. There's not this kind of thing that we're putting off till later. You know, whatever it is, we're going to deal with God about it today. We're going to take care of it. We're going to clear the slate. And we're going to breathe easy because now we're, we're what? We're blameless. Okay, God has dealt with it in His way appropriately. And now we're, we're, we're good. We're good with each other. That's what blameless looks like. And so these 144,000 are not sinless, they're blameless. So furthermore, we're told, and this is super interesting, and it kind of leads into what is going to happen at the end of the chapter. It says that these have been redeemed from mankind as 
first fruits of God and the Lamb. Now, what are first fruits? Well, if you go back through Scripture, the word first fruits is mentioned lots of times, and it goes way back into the Old Testament. There in Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, the feast of first fruits is mentioned uh, frequently. And it was a not only a holiday that comes about three weeks after Passover, um, but it was a time when the grain harvest was ripe. And so when the, the, the spring, it was like late spring, so when that grain harvest would, would, would be ripe, what they would do, uh, which again was prescribed in the Old Testament, is they would go and they would, uh, they would cut a sheaf of standing grain. Okay, so the grain's ready in the field. You've seen how, what that looks like. You've got uh, the, the stalks of wheat or rye or whatever, and they've changed color. They're not green anymore. They've turned brown, uh, and it's just kind of standing there. It's dry. It's ready to be harvested. So that's when this would be. So they would go out into the field. They would take a, like a sickle or a, a scythe. You've seen a, a long wooden handle with a, like a curved um, you know, metal blade. So you go out and you cut the grain. Okay, so it's time to do that. But the Feast of First Fruits was about that before the grain was harvested, you know, like for consumption, they would go out and the first fruits, the first of that harvest was set aside for the Lord. And so they would go out, they would cut the first, like chronologically, the first little bit of it, which was also the best. It's like the, the best part and the first part. They go out and they would cut it, and that would be part of their 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 um offering to the Lord for the Feast of First Fruits. So I say all that to, to say this. What we're talking about in chapter 14 is a harvest that is coming not of, not of wheat, but of, but of souls. Okay, when we read through the end of chapter 15, what's, or 14, what's happening is actually by the time we get to the end of the chapter, the world is being harvested but this 144,000 stand apart as special or different uh, in some, some ways uh, because they're first fruits okay, of this harvest that's about to happen. So as Jesus comes back, he's going he's gonna to harvest the, the world, uh, and, and we'll develop that thought in just a second. But this is the, these are first fruits. Okay? They're the first fruits. They're chronologically first, uh, and they're sort of like first in... Uh, quality, if you want to say that. So it's kind of like, you know, we went to the state fair the other day, you know, we went in and there's all these exhibits, they got all these, you know, canned goods and pies and breads and cakes and preserves and jelly and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, up, it, it, it's sort of, you know, representative of this year's harvest, you know, all the fields and, you know, orchards in North Carolina, they've got all this stuff to offer. But you, then you go to the fair and like, they've got this one sort of cabinet, this one showcase over here, and it's like best in show, and it's like this is first. It's the first place, you know. It's that's that's kind of what this we're getting here. So it's like a, it's a harvest season, but we've got this hundred and forty-four thousand that are set apart as first fruits. So we spent a lot of time on that. I wanted to kind of keep moving on. I know we um, we're not probably going to have a chance to develop all of this, but I want to look at the messages of the three angels. So as we get, it's, that's the first voice, voice of victory, is this 144,000 singing. But it says, then I saw another angel, um, John writes, flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And so what we have here is a very basic gospel message. Uh, it sounds a lot like what's uh, being unpacked in Revelation, or excuse me, Romans chapter one. It's just acknowledging an acknowledgement of God based upon the creation. Okay. Acknowledging him as creator. That's what this is, is essentially in this message. Um, but it's being proclaimed by an angel. It says flying directly overhead. Now that's kind of weird. Okay, we, we don't have that in this particular day and time, right? We don't have the, like a supernatural being flying around um, proclaiming the gospel in the heavens. What well, sure would make missions a lot easier if we, could, <laughs> if we had something like that, wouldn't it? Well, in this day and time, the gospel is being taken to the ends of the earth by people like me and you. 
who get involved in taking that message around the world to different people groups. It's one of the reasons that we support missionaries so heavily is because we believe that today that is our assignment. God has uniquely tasked us with and assigned us uh, the, the, the job of and equipped us for taking that gospel message to the ends of the earth. Um, we don't know if that assignment will be finished before he comes back. Uh, but what we do know is that uh, at this, this end time before he returns, there will be um, this angel who will be tasked with sharing the gospel. Um, and he's going to do it, uh, it says, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Now, that's a monumental assignment. I mean, it's right now it's taking thousands and thousands of people and man hours and uh, money and all this to try to reach these, these nation, the nations with the gospel. Um, God's going to do it supernaturally, which tells me a couple of things, uh, one of which is that um, he doesn't need us to do this, but right now he wants us. Okay, he, wants, uh, he wants to involve us in something that he could totally do himself. But right now, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, that's something that he's allowing us to be a part of. It's a privilege to be a part of that. So this angel's flying around, he's sharing the gospel. Um, and then it says, a, another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Um, so there's not a lot there. It's just one brief sentence as far as this message, and um, we'll, we'll take up more of the, the topic of this Babylon when we get to chapter, I think it's 16. But um, Babylon, what it, what it really represents, I mean, of course, Babylon is a literal city that existed in the Middle East, um, and it was founded on or in the, on the ruins of, um, with the, the same type of... Um, philosophy, I guess, as its predecessor city, Babel. And so what we know about Babylon um, may be referring to a literal city here, um, but even if it's not, it's definitely referring to it uh, in a spiritual sense. And so what, what is that about? Well, when you think about Babylon and, and its precursor, Babel, uh, what does it represent? Well, it actually represents uh, man's uh, stubborn, uh, rebellious opposition to God. And so that's what it really is about. So if you remember from Genesis, the, the story of Babel, it was God told them to go out and to disperse, told them to go disperse, go fill the earth with his image, fill the earth with people who will bear his image. That was the assignment. And um, they, did, they, they understood the assignment. They did not complete the assignment. In fact, they said, no, we're not going to do that. And so what they did was, in stubborn opposition to God, who told them to disperse, they said, no, we're going to make bricks. We're going to make, not just make bricks, we're not even just going to make like mud bricks. We're going to make like kiln-fired, like permanent bricks, and we're going to put them together with pitch for mortar, and we're going to create this tower right here as a kind of a great big finger in the face of God saying, we're not going to do it. And so this this tower of Babel sort of represents this idea of, of, of man building this tower, which it's, we're told its top was unto heaven. And in Hebrew, it's, it's kind of a little ambiguous as to whether that means that they were just building it really tall. So is that really just an, an affront to God, just saying, you know, you told us to disperse. Let me just show you like how we can pile up right here. And, and it could just be sort of an affront to God just as in its, in its vertical size. Um, so it could be that, but it could also be, and it seems to be probably more likely, has something to do with pagan idolatry. Uh, the idea that this tower was made with its top unto heaven um, may have something to do with, we know at this time that Babel was being built was about the time that the nations really began to develop this pagan idolatry, and they began to worship the planets. They began to worship um, this pantheon of um, you know, pagan gods and goddesses and deities and things. And uh, it was out of that that started at Babel that we get like Roman um, mythology, Greek mythology. You've got all these pagan practices, which involved, guess what? Sexual immorality. And so that was part of the worship system. 
So whatever this Babylon represents, the second angel, this voice of victory, is saying whatever, whatever all that encompasses, whatever that turns out to the fullness of that to involve, it will be over at the return of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that man has set up in rebelliousness and obstinate just rejection of God, that's going to be over, whatever that turns out to mean. Uh, whatever city, whatever economic system, whatever pagan practice, all that's going to be a thing of the past uh, when Jesus comes back. Third angel, it says, followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image, of course, and we talked about that in chapter 13, um, and it receives the mark on his forehead or in his hand, uh, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength uh, into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. Okay, don't, don't sign me up for that. Okay. But it says, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So as we talked about last week, you know, we don't know what this mark of the beast is technically what it represents. But what we do know is that in this time, people will not receive this unknowingly. They won't receive it without understanding full well what it is, what it means, the consequences of it. Um, but we know that, that most will choose it because they, will, they need this mark to be able to buy and sell. And so this mark is um, associated with econ economics, um, that they will, ha will have to have this mark if they're going to buy and sell. And, um, and if they don't, they won't. And so it's really, they're going to be between a rock and a hard place. But um, the Lord wants, wants people to know, and he's going to have this angel making sure that people know what it represents to choose the mark and a temporary fulfillment of these needs. Um, they're going to understand the eternal consequences that come with that. And then on the flip side, we've got those who don't receive the mark of the beast who trade the temporary trouble that it's going to cause, and it's going to be intense. They're going to trade that for eternal reward. And so there's a definite contrast that's, that's building here. And so that's why in the next couple of verses it says, here is a call for the endurance of, of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So, again, it's going to be tough, a lot tougher than it is now. I mean, and, you know, even in today's time, we as Christians experience uh, opposition, we experience persecution. People don't really like to hear, per se, the Christian gospel because it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit offensive. Okay, sometimes it's a lot offensive. But the Christian gospel that says, you know, I have nothing to offer God in and of myself, but I submit to him re repentantly, changing my mind about sin, recognizing that I am a sinner and that I have nothing to offer God. I cast myself upon his mercy, trusting in the name of Jesus. Okay, People do not like to hear that they don't have anything to offer God other than repentant faith. That's offensive. To a lot of people, and uh, and it's not going to stop being offensive. In fact, in fact, when we when we get into this time, which uh, again I believe we won't be here for this, uh, most of us, but this uh, this time it's going that persecution is going to intensify. It's going to be even worse. Uh, the world is really, really, really not going to want to hear that. Um, and so it says, here's a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And it says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their deeds and their, or from their labors and their deeds do follow them. And so there's a sense in which uh, all of us who are believers, uh, when we pass away from this body, uh, we, we really, that's a, that's a gain. Okay? That's a plus. That's an upgrade. Okay, because we know from the scriptures that we go to be with the Lord. And we will rest from our labors. We will rest. And that word means, like if you look that up, it means rest. <laughs> it means peace. It means calm. It means uh, to relax. And the labor that we're resting from, it's not just like work 
the word there in the Greek is, is not just the word for work. It's like work with like trouble mixed in with it, with toil mixed in with it, with problems mixed in with it, with beatings mixed in with it. That's, the, that's what we're resting from. Okay? All of us will experience that to some degree. For believers, we, we have it rough now in some sense, and we're going to where it's going to be better. But even more so, and this this is really essentially it's talking about this group, um, you know, in these end times, it's going to be even more intense for them. Okay, they're going to suffer more opposition. But then on the flip side, there's going to be great reward from that, and so they will experience, uh, in a, in some ways, a greater rest um, or greater contrast in those two things. So, well, I know we're kind of running short on time. There's there's coming in these last few verses here, this harvest of the earth. And uh, I just want to touch on it briefly as we, as we kind of close. Maybe we can come back to this. But we said earlier, the 144,000 were first fruits. They're sort of the first part of this harvest that's going to take place as Jesus returns. And as we read through these last few verses, and let's just maybe read them together. It says, uh, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Remember what a sickle is. What's a sickle used for? For reaping. Okay, usually reaping grain, right? So here's the sickle in his hand. It says, Another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle. Okay, so start using it. It says, And reap, for the hour to reap has come, but the harvest for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the clouds swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Then another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has the authority over the fire. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. So this is the second, second angel with a second sickle. Okay. It says, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth. Now that's a little weird. Okay, you use a sickle to harvest grain. You don't use a sickle to harvest grapes. But that's the picture here. It says, put in your sickle, gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth, gathered the grape harvest of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for uh, 1600 stadia so uh, and we're, and we're going to come back to that because that's kind of developed a little more in a future chapter but let's just say this at the end of the age there's a harvest okay and jesus talked about it he talked about it in matthew chapter 13 uh, this is not new information it's maybe just being packaged a little differently but jesus talked about this um you know the parable of the dragnet if you're familiar with that we studied that not long ago Jesus said the, uh, the kingdom of heaven is, is, is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it on shore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. Jesus says, so it will be at the close of the age. And that's what we're reading about in chapter 14, the close of the age. It says, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth um and in a we won't take time to read it all right now but if you read also matthew chapter 13 the parable of the weeds okay also is a, another picture of of what we're reading about this harvest of the earth that at the end of the age which when jesus comes back there'll be there'll be two harvests there's basically uh the harvest of the grain which jesus says is a picture of uh, his followers, okay, they're going to be gathered into his barn, and then there's going to be a harvest of the weed, the weeds or the tares, okay, and they're going to be gathered into bundles and burned. And so uh, Jesus unpacks that because the disciples say, "Explain that to us." And fortunately for us, we have that in in writing. His response: Jesus unpacks it, and says, "This is what it's about." And so what we find is that it is exactly about what we're reading in Matthew or Revelation 14. So there's this coming harvest of the earth. And um, so we'll close with this. Um, obviously, a lot that we could say about this, a lot of different directions that we could go. But what are these voices saying? We've looked at, um, 
okay, like seven different voices. We've got the 144,000. Uh, we've had the three different angels making proclamations. We've had these voices from heaven talking about this harvest. Uh, so what's the deal? What do, we, what do we do with all of this information? Well, there's a, there's a lot of information about future things, which is uh, probably necessary. Um, but there's also sort of an imme more immediate application, and I'm just going to kind of narrow it down to one today. Um, and I just want to say it this way, um, and we'll close with this. There's a, there's right now, there's a window of decision. There's a window of opportunity right now that's today where you and I have a decision on what we're going to do with, with Jesus. What are we going to do? Like, are we, are we going to accept Jesus by faith? Um, or are we going to reject that? And right now that window is open. Okay, as long as you and I, as we draw breath, that, that opportunity is here, it's available. Um, but the Bible also tells us that it's appointed unto man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. And so none of us know how long that window is going to be open, but what we do know is that it's, uh, the, that's, it's closing. Okay, it's closing, it's closing rapidly. We don't know when that window will be, will be closed, but once, once we check out, okay, the window's closed. Um, so either we check out, the window's closed, or this day comes and the window is closed. So it's one or the other. Um, but we're only ever getting closer to that moment. And so it's more and more and more pressingly important that we take the opportunity that we have today to make a decision about what we're going to do spiritually, eternally. Um, and most of you have made that choice. You've, 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 you've already been there. But for those of you who have not, um, it's appointed unto man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. And on what basis are we going to be, be able to stand in that judgment? Okay, if I'm trusting in my righteousness, if I'm trusting in what I can produce, what I can do, well, that might be good if I'm being compared to you or you're being compared to me. But the standard that we have is a different standard. We're being compared to God. And the, the comparison there is, uh, it's, we, we pale in comparison. We don't measure up. And so it's so important that you know, while we still have this window of, of opportunity to make this decision, that we turn to Jesus for salvation. It's so important because, again, we never know when, when that window is going to close. Um, and so, as I've you know, said before, um, because we love and care about those around us, we want folks to understand that the gospel is the answer, okay? That Jesus came, he lived a perfect and sinless life. He was righteous, not like my righteousness. He came, he lived a perfect, sinless life, died on the cross in my place, and the Bible says that those who put their faith and trust in Him, and that's just talking about repentant faith, okay, a faith that agrees with God about the nature of my sin, that kind of faith, a repentant faith in Him is what it takes. And um, so I just want to share, share with you that. And then as Christians, because I know a lot of you are believers, um, the fact that the wind, okay, we've sort of got this window of decision, this window of opportunity, you know, while we're still kind of here and drawing breath, uh, to do things, one of the things that we may want to consider is that, um, you know, earlier we talked about being blameless. This 144,000, they're blameless. Okay, you and I have an opportunity to be, to be blameless. Okay, not sinless. We've already kind of blown that. <laughs> but we have an opportunity to be blameless. And is there something in your life? Is there something in my life that between me and God, it's just not right? Okay, maybe I'm saved, maybe I'm a child of God, maybe I know heaven's going to be my home, that's all that's settled, but there's something in my life that's just like, God's not okay with it being there. Maybe it's something that I'm doing, maybe it's something I'm not doing. Is there something like that in your life that today there's a window of opportunity that God is giving you or me to deal with that thing? Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's not a salvation issue, maybe it's a blameless kind of issue. Is there something like that, that that God is wanting you to do business with him about? So I don't know. Um, so I'm praying that, you, that if that is the case, that you take that opportunity today. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. Um, Lord, I thank you for your word today. Thank you for uh, 
for this message. Thank you for the encouragement. I know it's, it's kind of some, some heavy stuff, Lord, but I, I thank you for it that uh, sometimes it's just good to hear the, the truth um, about, uh, you know, the reality of things and not just, you know, paint a cute picture about, about stuff that, um, if that's not the, the case. And so we just, you know, we're, we're thankful for your truth today. We're thankful for your love for us through Jesus. Um, Lord, pray that to just help us today to just to do business with you in whatever way, shape, or form that that may be, um, that we might walk with you in peace and in joy, uh, in hope, in confidence, and to walk with you blameless. Lord, pray for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.